and welcome to today's lecture on software pipelining. We are discussing about data hazards and in the last lecture we have seen how uh, we can minimize or reduce the uh, data hazards that means overcome the stalls with the help of a software approach known as loop unrolling. What it essentially does, it increases the size of the basic block. So, suppose you have got a loop in which these are the three instructions which are data dependent. So, in the main body of the loop, you have got three instructions A, B, C and this is the data dependency graph. So, these three instructions are dependent as a consequence they cannot be executed uh, simultaneously or in a overlapped manner. So, by using loop unrolling what is being done uh, uh, A, B, C then if we unroll three times A, B, C and then A, B, C. So, you have now got six instruction in your basic block and since the instructions of the of, of uh, different iteration or different loop are usually independent. Uh, the within these nine instructions, uh, the uh, data dependency is obtained. So instruction level parallelism is increased by using this basic block, and then these instructions are rescheduled to uh, uh, to execute uh, the program in such a way that the stalls are reduced. That is the basic approach. Uh, we have discussed in the last lecture and it is a software based approach and we have also seen that uh, loop unrolling with instruction scheduling has three different types of limits. Number one is the decrease in the amount of overhead which is amort amortized with each unroll. For example, if the loop is unrolled eight times, the overhead is reduced from half cycles of the original iteration to one by four. So, uh, that happens and the growth of the code size uh, due to loop unrolling uh, that leads to uh, cache misses and as a consequence you cannot really unroll many times. Third uh, uh, limit that, uh, that is due to shortfall of resistors created by aggressive unrolling and scheduling and this is known as resistor pressure. We have already discussed in detail these issues. and. Uh, we have seen that loop unrolling improves the performance by eliminating overhead instructions. Loop unrolling is a simple but useful method to increase the size of the straight line code fragments. This is a sophisticated high level transformation uh, which leads to significant increase in the complexity of the compiler. So, this loop unrolling and instruction schedule is, is done at the cost of increased uh, compiler complexity. But we have seen in spite of that fact, it has got some limitations because it increases the size of the code that leads to cache misses and other things. We shall discuss about another approach where some of these limitations are overcome and this is known as software pipelining. And this eliminates the loop independent dependencies through code restructuring. So, by restructuring the code the uh, loop independent dependencies uh, are uh, eliminated and obviously it leads, uh, leads to uh, reduced uh, number of stalls. It helps to achieve better performance in pipeline execution and one most one very important factor is as compared to simple loop unrolling, it consumes less code space that means size of the code is small. Now, uh, let me explain how exactly it is being done. So, uh, <coughs> let us let me start with the again the same data dependency graph A, B, C. This is your data dependency graph and uh, whenever we try to execute in a pipeline manner, we may write it in this way A, B, C then in the next cycle. A B C, next cycle A B C, next cycle <coughs> A B C, A B C and so on. 
Now, if we look at this, we find that uh, we can divide this into three parts. In this case, you can see this instruction C of the first iteration, say maybe iteration i, instruction B of iteration i plus 1 and instruction A of iteration i plus 2, we can combine them and form a single loop where these three instructions will be executed. Since they have been taken from different iterations, they are presumed to be independent. That means, this C, this B, this A, they belong to different iterations and as a consequence, they are uh, independent. That means, uh, here we can see that C V A, C V A, C V A, this will form a loop. That means, uh, this part uh, can be considered as a loop like this C B A this will form a loop and of course, you, you will have the uh, these three instructions will be there, they are to be executed uh, and uh, uh, you have to execute the remaining instructions which are left out. So, uh, it will have a kind of prologue and epilogue, but this part can be executed uh, in the form of a loop and uh, by doing this you find that there will be uh, the, since these three instructions are independent, uh, there will be no stall in the pipeline. So, that is what is being done in group unrolling. That means, we are taking instructions from different loops as it is done in case of hardware pipeline. We have seen in a hardware pipeline what was done say uh, instruction fetch instruction decode, instruction execute, then, uh, then memory uh, operation, then write back. So, what was done uh, <coughs> uh, so, what was done these instructions were executed or these instructions say instruction fetch they were executed uh, in a I mean one uh, in a pipeline. Similarly, here also you are doing the same thing, but here it was uh, done for a single instruction. Now, we have taken instructions from three different uh, iterations. So, that is uh, I mean uh, from this simple uh, feature that means exactly just as it happens in a hardware pipeline, we are doing it in the same manner. That means, in each iteration of a software pipeline code, some instructions of some iteration of the original loop is executed. So, this uh, what I have explained is shown in this. So, we form a kernel C V A, which can be executed in the form of a loop and uh, this is essentially software pipelining. Let me illustrate this with the help of an example. Okay, so, this is the same I explained, uh, same thing explained. The central idea is to reorganize loops, each iteration is made from instruction chosen from different iteration of the original loop. That means, uh, here for example, we had iteration i 0, i 1, i 2, i 3, i 4 and i 5, but some instruction from iteration i 0, some from i, I 1, some from i 2, some from i 3 and some for i 4 are taken to form one loop and then similarly in the next iteration instruction from i 1, i 2, i 3, i 4 and i 5 is taken that forms another loop. Okay. So, this is the software pipeline iteration and two iterations are shown here. Let me illustrate this with the help of an example, uh, but before that uh, here it is explained how is it done, is this done, how this software pipelining is implemented or done. So, number one step is unroll loop body with an unroll factor n. So, here also uh, just like the loop unrolling uh, is done to improve the instruction level parallelism, which I have explained in the last lecture. Here also you will be, you will be doing loop unrolling, but uh, for a different objective. Here the objective is different, the way the instructions are executed is different from the previous case. 
So, unrolling is done, then select order of instructions from different iteration uh, uh, iterations to pipeline. So, here you have to uh, select instructions from different iterations to, uh, to form a pipeline and then paste instructions from different iteration into the new pipeline loop body. So, you will form a pipeline loop body and uh, taking instructions or rather pasting instructions from different iterations. Let me <coughs> come, come back to our original example. This was the static loop unrolling example uh, that we with the help of this we, <coughs> we explained the uh, loop unrolling and subsequently how loop unrolling was done to improve the instruction level parallelism that I explained in the last lecture. Now, in this case, uh, uh, you have got three instructions in the main body of the iteration and these two, the third and I mean fourth and fifth instructions, they are essentially uh, loop manipulation instructions which are used for uh, housekeeping. And <coughs> now, here the as I mentioned, the loop body is unrolled three times. So, you have got three instructions uh, and uh, the first, the first three instructions will belong to iteration 1, second three instructions belong to iteration i plus 1 and then the uh, last three instructions belong to iteration i, I plus 2. And of course, whenever loop unrolling is done, the uh, loop overhead instructions are not needed, <coughs> they have been removed. And so, two instructions which are present here have been removed, two instructions which are present here have been removed and in a single loop body of restructured loop would contain instructions from different iteration of the original loop body. Let us see how this is being done. Now, what you are doing? We are taking three instructions, uh, first instruction from iteration 1, second instruction from iteration i plus 1 and third instruction from iteration i plus 2. So, whenever you uh, take instructions from different iterations, you have to uh, select it in such a way that each instruction must be selected at least once to make sure that we do not leave, leave out any instruction of the original loop in the pipeline body loop. That means, uh, here uh, ultimately you have to execute your program and it has to give correct result and it will give correct result only when all the instructions are executed. And uh, that to, uh, to do that, you have to be careful. That means, in this particular case, for example, uh, you are taking third instruction from iteration 1, second instruction from iteration i plus 1, first instruction from iteration i plus 2. So, you are taking all the three instructions, maybe from three different iterations in your uh, loop body uh, of the uh, software pipeline. And that means, uh, in, when in one iteration, these three will be executed. In the second iteration, the, uh, the other three instructions, other, uh, one, that means another instruction from iteration 1 will be executed, another instruction for I iteration i plus 1 will be executed and another instruction for i plus 2 will be executed. So, this is how uh, it will be done. So, this is a very simple program having only three instructions in the loop body. If you have uh, more number of uh, instructions in the loop body, you have to be very careful uh, to pick up instructions and put them in your uh, uh, software pipeline. <coughs> so, with these three instructions, now we have formed a uh, loop. So, here we have formed a loop as you can see uh, taking uh, instruction 3 from iteration 1, instruction 2 of iteration uh, 2 iteration i plus 1 and instruction 1 of iteration 3. So, these three is forming the uh, loop of the uh, software pipeline. So, they belong to three different iterations. Then of course, uh, since we are interested in forming a loop here, we have to put those loop manipulation instructions. Uh, this one you will uh, reduce the value of the pointer to point to the next element of the array and this will uh, decide how many times the loop looping will be done. That means, you have to carry out the execution of this loop 
that uh, it, uh, we init it, that was for thousand times in our original program. It was thousand times. It is not shown here, but in our original program, uh, it will loop for thousand times. So to facilitate that, that register R two was stored with the value. I mean, uh, <coughs> I mean, uh, I mean it was zero. So initially R one is initialized with thousand, and then it is decremented. And until the uh, and then you keep on comparing, and then you uh, whenever these two are equal, then you stop it. You come out of this loop. This is how it is being done. So we find that the software pipeline will have now. Uh, this is the fourth step where you will be having uh, the pipeline loop body. And pipeline loop body, you can see. You have to adjust the uh, the, uh, the various values. Uh, I mean, the, so that the effective address points to the right element of the array, and uh, so that's why here it is 16 R1. Then uh, you are loading the value of uh, that array element in register F4, and you are adding it with the constant that is being stored in uh, <coughs> zero. Oh, sorry. This is the stored data, and uh, stored data, add data, and load data. So you have taken from three different instructions. So we cannot really explain the operation from this thing, but you have to go back to the original program to do that. So these are the this is this is forming the basic loop, and here uh, this instruction has been taken from m i m i minus one and m i minus two. So and <coughs> And you have uh, the uh, pre header where you have to fill the uh, add the instructions which are to be uh, executed uh, are to be executed before you execute this loop. Similarly, after this loop execution is complete, you will require several instructions pre present here. Let us see what are the instructions that will be present in the uh, in the pre header and post header. So, uh, if we consider this, your uh, loop body is loop stored double F four sixteen R one, then add double F four F zero F two, then load double. F zero zero R one, and this is decrementing the pointer D A D D U Y, and R one comma R one comma minus eight. So you are decrementing by eight, and B N E B N E R one R two loop. Okay, now this is your uh, main loop body. What will be in your uh, 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 pre-header? You will you must have pre-header and post-header. So <coughs> here we are left with three instructions: that load F zero comma R zero R one add D F four F zero comma F two. So you have to execute these three instructions. That means load load double F zero comma zero R one and <coughs> add double. At double F four, comma F zero, comma F two. Now, uh, if these two instructions are executed one after the other, we know that this will lead to a stall here. What can be done? Another load, that second load that is present here, this load can be uh, filled up uh, in between uh, these two instructions. So, if you do that, then load double, uh, you have to uh, fill. This one you have to fill with 
you know you cannot feel it this way i think we have to then you have to use different resistor value so you have to load double uh, f0 0 r1 so to uh, here you have to actually increase the value of uh, value uh, value by 8 because it points to the next a, a array element so that you have to do so f, uh, first instruction is done this way uh, and then second instruction is done this way this is how you have to execute i mean the free header will for, uh, form these three instructions maybe you have to insert a stall here and your post header will require three instructions that uh, stored data uh, f4 0 r1 uh, add double f4 comma f0 comma f2 and then stored double f4 comma 0 r1 now you see uh, your r1 was uh, you have to adjust the value here such that these two are stored in two different places so here actually this will be minus 8 and this will point to the proper error elements that means storing has to be done in a different way uh, so uh, these 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 three instructions and these three instructions are to be ex executed uh, before and after this uh, loop body so <coughs> that will form the uh, pre header and post header so you have to fill those instructions and this part that pre header and post header part may have uh, few stalls but main body of the loop will not have any stall because they have been taken from uh, different uh, different uh, uh, iterations and they are independent so this is the basic idea of loop body now let us consider the important issues related to software pipeline. So, register management can be tricky. Uh, in more complex example, we may need to increase the iterations between uh, when data is read and when the results are used. Actually, if we go back to our or this, this problem, we find that uh, in the pre header part, in the post header part, the register management has to be done properly such that uh, ultimately the program gives you correct result. So, uh, the way I have written it may not give you uh, the correct uh, result because uh, the register management part has not been uh, taken into consideration properly and that you have to take into consideration. Then optimal software pipelining has been shown to be an NP complete problem. So, I have illustrated this with the help of a very simple example and it appeared to be very simple, but whenever you consider uh, real life problems which are uh, where the number of instructions in the loop body is more and uh, later on we shall discuss uh, when it is being done in the context of uh, your uh, super, uh, super scalar architecture. Uh, then I, I, then it, it becomes a very uh, non-trivial problem and it has been found that it is NP complete problem and whenever uh, so whenever the problem is NP complete and you have to solve it there is no uh, deterministic algorithm which will give you an optimal result. So, what you have to do you have to uh, use a heuristic based approach. So, that is being tried present solution are based on heuristic. So, heuristic based uh, approach is used for uh, for uh, for uh, software pipelining and, uh, and some lot of research has been carried out uh, to achieve proper software pipelining to improve the performance of the program execution. And another very important aspect is you can see if we compare loop unrolling and software pipelining, we find that software pipelining takes less, less code space. We have seen that uh, the uh, one very one very important limitation of loop unrolling was that increases the size of the code. So, since the size of the code is big and you have to load it in the cache memory before you execute it, it may lead to cache misses. 
but when the size of the code is small that problem does not arise. So, this software pipelining facilitates that it has got uh, less code space and software pipelining and loop unrolling reduce different types of inefficiencies. So, the uh, inefficiency in terms of instruction level parallelism that is present in the program and uh, it does the, the two approaches uh, uh, reduce the inefficiencies uh, in two different ways or rather and uh, that uh, different types of inefficiencies are reduced. So, loop unrolling reduces loop management overheads as we have seen it uh, the additional uh, loop management overheads which are present if you unroll uh, uh, each time you unroll you uh, reduce the number of uh, those overheads. So, those overheads are reduced and software pipelining allows a pipeline to run at full efficiency by eliminating loop independent dependencies. So, uh, in, in case of software pipelining, uh, the <coughs> it allows the uh, you know by the it, it improves the efficiency by eliminating loop independent uh, def uh, dependencies. That means, uh, by taking instructions from different loops which are independent. Uh, you are forming a loop body and that is how you are increasing the efficiency of the program. <coughs> so, uh, you can visualize the two approaches software pipelining and loop unrolling. The top diagram corresponds to software pipelining. So, as I mentioned there will be a, start, a startup code and wind, uh, wind down code you have got the uh, software pipelining and number of overlapped operations are shown here. Here uh, the number of overlapped operation is maximum, but in this part and in this part the number of instructions which can be executed in overlapped manner that will be reduced. On the other hand the bottom diagram corresponds to loop unrolling, where only uh, the middle part which is proportional to the number of unrolls, where you have got uh, and the maximum number of instructions which can be executed in overlap manner, but the other parts overlap between unroll uh, unro iterations, they are the uh, you know the number of instructions which can be overlapped in a, uh, in a executed in overlap manner that is uh, that is smaller. So, these two diagrams compares or visualizes these two basic approaches. Now, uh, so far, uh, what we have tried, uh, we have tried to unroll the loop or we have tried another approach that is software pipelining by which uh, we have tried to execute the program. Uh, so, that the cycles per instruction CPI, a CPI of 1 is achieved that means, maximum throughput bounded by one instruction per cycle. That is the that is the maximum that can be achieved in both the approaches. That means, what we are doing uh, that uh, per cycle one instruction is executed, when it can happen, when there is no stall. So, only when there is no stall, we shall be able to achieve a upper limit of CPI is equal to 1 and beyond that it cannot be done by using these approaches. So, inefficient unifications of instructions into one pipeline that means, oh, we are trying to combine different types of instructions for example, ALU operations, memory stage operations floating point operations, we are trying to uh, do a, I mean inefficient unification of instructions into one pipeline. That means, we are forming a single pipeline, where these are uh, being uh, inefficiently combined and uh, this rigid nature of in order pipeline. That means, we are trying to execute one instruction followed by an instruction, uh, another instruction. So, they will be executed in a in order but and that is very rigid in the sense that if a particular instruction execution 
is stalled because of some reason, then the second instruction also uh, is stalled that is not allowed to progress. And so, uh, that problem arises in a scalar pipeline. Now, <coughs> so higher ILP processor, how can we increase the ILP or we can have, uh, how we can have CPI less than 1. So far we have assumed that our upper limit is CPI is equal to 1 we cannot still reduce it. CPI can be more than 1 whenever you have got stall, but now we are trying to achieve more than 1 C, I mean CPI which is less than 1. In other words, we are trying to execute more than 1 instruction in a single cycle and uh, there are two basic approaches. One is known as VLIW, very large instruction word. And another approach is known as superscalar. So, in both the cases, the basic approach is to have uh, more than one functional unit. So, the number of functional unit that is present both in VLIW approach or in superscalar approach is more than 1. So far, we assume that you have got only one uh, functional unit and where you are which is pipeline. Now, in VLIW or superscalar, we shall be trying to we shall be having more than one functional unit. Since we have got more than one functional unit, we will be able to, uh, we shall be able to issue more than one instruction at a time, more than one operation at a time. That means, uh, this will help in uh, getting the CPI which is less than 1. So, in a superscalar or VLIW processors, you have got more than one functional unit in a single CPU. So, you have got only one CPU, but unlike one ALU present in a CPU, you have got more than one functional unit. So, that is the basic approach followed, but the way these two are done in two different cases are different. The uh, in case of VLIW, the compiler has complete responsibility of selecting a set of instructions to be executed concurrently. That means, uh, that instruction level parallelism ILP that is being exploited uh, in superscalar or VLIW, they are done in a different way. In VLIW, the responsibility is given to compiler. That means, compiler identifies which instructions can be executed in parallel and those instructions for corresponding to those instructions you have got separate functional units and they are executed. That means, the compiler is given the complete responsibility for identifying C the instruction level parallelism and then uh, the a single instruction will be having more than one operation which can be fed to different functional units. That is done in case of VLIW. On the other hand, in case of superscalar approach, there uh, compiler is simple, compiler is ordinary and simple ordinary, ordinary compiler, but the hardware identifies which instructions can be issued simultaneously, can be executed concurrently. So, responsibility is done by 
uh, concurrently. Then you know the, the, the uh, several is, uh, more than one instructions are issued which are fed to different functional units. So, these are the functional units here also. So, both the cases you have got functional units, but uh, in case of uh, VLIW these instructions are formed with the help of compiler, then they are executed in order. On the other hand in superscalar the hardware finds out which instructions uh, can be uh, uh, executed. So, you have got a instruction issue hardware. which will uh, generate several operations to be performed by different functional units. Now, <coughs> in case of super, superscalar processors, it can be done in two ways. Number one is statically scheduled superscalar processor, where uh, multiple issue is performed, but in order execution take place. On the other hand, dynamic a day scheduled superscalar processor, uh, which will use uh, very specialized feature like specialized uh, uh, specialized uh, property like spe speculative execution, branch prediction and where you will allow out of order execution. So, uh, this will uh, this will require more hardware functionalities and complexities. So, later on I shall discuss about uh, these two techniques uh, which will provide you uh, higher ILP uh, and of course, loop unrolling will be necessary or software pipelining will be necessary to have uh, more number of I mean to increase the ILP. Now, uh, so far what I have discussed is uh, known as uh, static instruction pipelining which is done by compiler. Another approach is known as uh, dynamic instruction pipelining. Why dynamic instruction pipelining is needed? Uh, <coughs> and the in case of uh, uh, pipelining, we have seen uh, some hardware technique, forwarding, interlocking technique, uh, where the when there is a stall, I mean when there is a hazard, stalls are introduced or software based instruction restructuring is done. But the software based instruction restructuring is handicapped due to inability to detect many dependencies. We have discussed about different types of dependencies. Those dependencies which are visible at compile time the dependencies which are visible at compile time can be done with the help of static instruction scheduling. So, it is uh, very conservative is, na is natural. On the other hand, particularly uh, there are situations that means name dependencies involving memory if name dependencies involving memory is present in your program, this cannot be identified by the compiler at compile time, because they will be evident only when the program is executed that is at run time. So, the dependencies which are not revealed at compile time will be visible at run time and that is what is being done. Uh, uh, in case of dynamic instruction scheduling with the help of a hardware. So, the hardware determines the order in which instructions execute. So, this is in contrast to statically scheduled processor where the compiler determines the order of execution. And later on I shall discuss a technique by which this hardware scheduling is done. You will require a very specialized hardware which will do this instruction scheduling and the loop unrolling and other thing which is being done by the compiler will not be necessary whenever you do it with the help of a hardware and uh, various other things like uh, re, uh, that register renaming and other thing they are also incorporated uh, at the time of dynamic instruction scheduling. 
Okay. So, uh, that uh, we have uh, come to the end of uh, a very important topic that is instruction level parallelism, where pipelining uh, that uh, uh, where the pipeline uh, simple pipelines are used and uh, that instruction level parallelism is incorporated to achieve CPIU 1. So, some of the important points you should remember before we leave this topic is given here. First of all, what is pipelining that I, give, that I defined in the beginning? It is an implementation technique where multiple tasks are performed in an overlap manner, you may recall that. And when can it be implemented? I mentioned that it can be implemented when a task can be divided into two or more subtasks, which can be performed independently. Then second point is the earliest use of parallelism in designing CPUs uh, to enhance processing speed was pipelining. So, pipelining was is the uh, first parallelism that, that was incorporated in processors and pipelining does not reduces execution time of a single instruction, it increases the throughput that I have highlighted many times. Uh, whenever you execute instructions in a with the help of a pipeline processor, time needed to execute a single instruction is not reduced, rather it increases, because uh, you are performing different parts of an instruction by different stages, in different stages, but in between you have got uh, uh, those pipeline resistors or latches, which introduces some delay. So, if you consider the time needed to execute a single instruction, uh, maybe uh, instead of 10 nanosecond, it may take 11 nanosecond or more. So, uh, time needed to execute a single instruction reduces, uh, it is, uh, is, uh, is not uh, reduced. Uh, so, we have seen it was 40 nanosecond and nanosecond is in a non-pipeline processor and 44 nanosecond was required in a pipeline processor. We can see uh, for each uh, latch one additional delay was done, that is why in a pipeline processor single instruction was taking uh, 44 nanosecond. However, uh, if you consider the throughput, you will find that on the average per 11 nanosecond, you are getting one output and that is how the throughput is increased and giving you a speed up of 40 by 11. So, this is being highlighted at this, at this point. And another issue that I mentioned in detail, we have discussed about two types of processors, CISC and RISC having different features. CISC processors are not suitable for pipelining because of variable instruction format, variable execution time and complex addressing modes. On the other hand, RISC processors are suitable for pipelining because of fixed instruction format, fixed execution time and limited addressing modes. So, we have restricted our discussion to uh, pipelining of RISC processor. However, later on I shall uh, discuss about uh, that uh, Intel uh, a series of processors, wh which are essentially CISC, but uh, those processors, in those processors internally uh, the complex instructions are decomposed into risk like operations and they are executed in a pipe like manner. Later on I shall discuss about it. <coughs> then uh, I discussed about hazards, there are situations called hazards uh, that prevent the nest instruction stream from getting executed in its designated clock cycle and we have discussed about three different types of hazards, structural hazard which arises due to uh, non-availability of enough hardware resources and data hazards results uh, of earlier instructions not available. That means, uh, the in case of data dependency results needed by a subsequent instruction is not available because uh, the it has not yet been completed. So, that is why data hazards occurs and we have di discussed various techniques. Uh, for overcoming data hazards. Later on, we shall discuss about the control hazards and techniques of overcoming uh, control hazards. So, control decisions resulting from earlier instructions not yet made. That means, uh, the decision uh, is some time is required to take a decision whether a uh, branch will be taken or not taken and because of that delay, uh, there will be some 
stalls to be introduced and how that can be minimized that we shall discuss later. So, uh, we have discussed techniques for overcoming structural hazard and data hazard and uh, <coughs> in the next class, we shall discuss in more detail about the superscalar and the VLIW processors. Thank you.